noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us come and make a joyful noise and let us, uh, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. And then later on he says, come, let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. I don't know if you're coming in today ready to sing and praise and give thanks to the greatness of God, or maybe you're coming today with a lot on your mind or a lot on your shoulders, or you feel like you're crawling in into the presence of God. Well, he invites you there too. Jesus Christ said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle And I am lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Either way, he says, come. So here we are. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his bow and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above, is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice! Come and lift your hands. Your voice, He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King, and with trembling rejoice. We are children of the prophets, the beloved of the Lord, the one with everlasting kindness, but with sacrificial. Bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know The affections of a father who will never let them go Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise the voice He is worthy of all praise Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King And with trembling rejoice All our sickness, all our sorrows Jesus carried up the hill He has walked this path before us He is walking with us still Turning tragedy to triumph Turning agony to praise There is blessing in the battle So take heart and stand amazed Rejoice When you cry to Him He hears your voice He will wipe away your tears Rejoice In the midst of suffering He will help you sing Rejoice Come and lift your head of your King and with trembling rejoice. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a new song about an old truth. And Titus 3 reminds us and it says, but when the goodness and love for man appeared from God our Savior, Could they go on? Sorry, I don't have that pulled up. He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing and regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This 
the Spirit, he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Our God is good all the time. Even when it seems the answer's no, the promises of God don't find their yes. In Christ who work the Father's will below. That all who run to Him would find their rest. Even when it seems he hides his face And darkness seems to be our only friend We look to Christ who suffered in our place That one day all our suffering would end Our God is good God is good all of the time, and all of the time. God is good. God is good all of the time. God is good. Even when it seems He pays no mind, we have a guarantee of His great love. Christ who left, left his crown behind The one day we would reign with him above God is good all of the time And all of the time God is good God is good all of the time God is good Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief, Lord, we believe, but help our hearts to sing, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief, Lord, we believe. Help our hearts to sing that you are good all of the time, and all of the time, and you are good, you are good all of the time, you are good. Yes, you are good all of the time, and all of the time, you are good. You are good all of the time. You are good. Deliverer, you brought us out of the miry clay. You set our feet upon a rock and you made us safe. 
holy is the Lord. We will declare your thoughts about us one by one. Beats too many to count, so we simply come and sing of your great love. And so we sing, we lift our hands and sing. You are worthy of affection, you're the radiance of all of his glory. There the broken down and we are the beaten now but what can stop us from a song of an ending love holy is the lord this is who he is you are the treasure the hope the bright and morning star you are the lover of our soul and you've won our heart we sing of your great love so we sing, lift our hands and sing. Yeah. You are worthy of affection. You're the radiance of all of His glory. Let adoration fill this place. You hold.
All the ushers are coming. Thank you. Yeah, let's give the Lord. Yeah, amen. Oh, worthy. Worthy. Lord Jesus, you are worthy. We are not except in Christ. Thank you. Thank you for giving us something to boast about this morning, and that is the the glorious, worthy, holy, holy, holy God revealed in Christ Jesus, illuminated through the Holy Spirit today. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Work in our hearts today. Open up our hearts to you today. And Lord, as we, as we take an offering, Father, let even this time be an opportunity for you to get all of the glory from us. As we give from our hearts, as we give cheerfully, generously, Lord. But Father, most importantly, Lord, as we're just giving because of who you are today. The lover of our soul. The one who's won our hearts, Father, when we weren't even looking your way. Thank you. Love you. Love you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, while the offering plates are going by, I'm going to ask Lisa Rethemeyer if she would come. Operation Christmas Child is coming. This is one of the, the, the biggest ministries we do as a church especially globally. And so Lisa is, is spearheading and has some exciting information, and I just want to turn this mic over to her, Chris. Good morning. Today is our kickoff of Operation Christmas Child for 2021. If you are not familiar with Operation Christmas Child, it is a project sponsored by Samaritan's Purse. Can you hold it a little closer, Leah? And it is, um, the purpose of it is to show God's love in a tangible way to children around the world. We fill shoe boxes with toys and school supplies and hygiene items. And then Samaritan's Purse adds a leaflet called The Greatest Gift that tells the child about Jesus Christ in their own language. The boxes are handed out all over the world by local church volunteers, and the gospel is shared. The children are then invited to attend a 12-week discipleship course. Last year, in spite of the pandemic, there were over 9 million boxes packed and distributed. Samaritan's Purse encourages us to include a letter with our boxes, and this year I put a letter in with a picture of my family, and I also put my email address in there, and I was very pleased to get four different email responses, uh, two from different places in Cameroon, Africa, one from the Republic of Mali, in Africa, and one from the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa. And two of them included pictures, so I wanted to share them with you today. Um, this little girl is two years old, and her name is Success. Her father writes, Hi, my name is Joseph Mimbem Nujok, I live in Yaoundi, Cameroon. In the name of my family, I thank you for your gift. It is a great message and blessing for us. Our daughter, Success, two years old, is so glad. May our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and protect you and your family. And... The next picture is a little girl who's eight, and her name is Pretty. 
Her father writes, we are happy to make your acquaintance that you are in USA. We are pleased to get a family in America. We have received the gift from you. My daughter called Pretty Mafuda, she is eight, and she sings in a given choir in a small church. I think that is probably her choir robe that she's wearing in this picture. Um, she is in a family of seven. She is the fourth among two girls and five boys. You will realize that we write late for you because our daughter, Pretty, hided the letter. She doesn't want other people to share it. She would like to keep for herself your picture and of Daddy Chris and of her older brother, David. <laughs> I'm Pretty's father. My name is James Umba. I have got a wife, and her name is Blandine. We are in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the Ituri Providence in Bunia Town. We will be pleased to get your feedback. May God bless you. We love your family so much. So we hope that you will join us in filling shoeboxes this year. There's a table out in the foyer. We have plastic shoe boxes. We have cardboard shoe boxes. They're free. You can take them and fill them. You should have a handout in your bulletin that tells you how to pack a shoe box. And we ask that you return them to us by Sunday, November the 14th. Um, there's something a little bit new this year. These boxes go to 150 different countries around the world. And if you've ever traveled outside the U.S., you are aware what customs can be like. And getting these boxes through customs is a huge undertaking. They have begun to have problems with soap, of all things. And so they're asking this year that we leave the wrappers, the original um, wrapper or box that the soap comes in, we leave that on when we put it in our shoe box. To remind you of that, we're giving out little plastic soap containers with the first hundred boxes that we give out today. We're also giving out a little craft that the Ham family made for us. We have adhesive tape labels now. You don't have to cut and tape. You just stick them on and you can register the number off of them. They will tell you where your shoebox went. Um, we have letters that your children can write, can fill in, and send with their shoe boxes. And Samaritan's Purse has even come up with an app and a game for five to nine-year-olds called The Greatest Journey. We have information of that out there. Um, if you don't have the time or the ability to fill a shoebox, you can now go online and build a shoebox online. The information is on your little handout. There's an address there. It is fast and easy and very economical. It is $25, and that includes the $9 shipping. Um, the most important part of this ministry is prayer. And we ask that as we pack boxes, that you pray for the child that your box is to go to, that you pray that they would be delivered successfully in their country, and that you pray that each child will hear the gospel, will come to know about Jesus, 
and that they will have an opportunity to attend the discipleship classes to help them grow in their faith. So after service, come back to the table, and we will help you with your shoeboxes. And success. <laughs> pretty and success. That's pretty neat. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Judges. We just started a sermon series last week on this book of the Bible, the book of Judges. It is, um, it is not an easy book to read. If you've started reading through it, you Maybe for the first time you'll realize that, as I said last week, it really should come with a warning label, uh, maybe even a rating. <laughs> um, this morning we're going to have all kinds of multimedia stuff going on. Actually, I'm going to be, uh, I, I, I felt like it would be appropriate to kind of walk through Judges um, with you as we also bring Scripture up too, just to help us get the picture for where we're going. We're going to launch into the first of the couple judges, three, two of the first three judges this morning, but before we get there, I want, I want to remind you of the, um, kind of, the, of the, the, the promise, the plan ahead of time for what this book is and where it's going. The title of our, of our sermon series is Man's Best Effort. As we find out, our best effort is really futile, apart from God. The picture is of a Grand Canyon. I used that last week to show the, the, the incredible distance between us and God. And it's far greater than the Grand Canyon. That, that our best effort to get across that canyon, our best effort to get across the canyon of our sin and suffering, it's too, it's too big a jump for any of us to make. We all fall short of the glory of God. None of us can attain it. We need help. We need a deliverer. We need a bridge. And Jesus Christ has come to be the bridge to bring us from where we are in our sin to a holy God, only through the blood of Jesus Christ. So I want to start with this statement that I made last week, and it is God's plan from the beginning. Since Genesis 3, since the fall of man, God's plan has always been to reveal the power of his grace through the display of his glory. Through weak and sinful people whom he rescues. He does it. People who are growing more and more overwhelmed by his grace and learning to live utterly dependent on his grace to obey him and to become like him. And that's, that's what Judges is here to show us. There are, the, the book, as I said last week, is a tragedy. I called it a tragedy, and it is. It's in the Bible to be a tragedy. It's bookended in the second chapter and the last chapter by really two primary statements that kind of um, uh, reveal the two central problems in the whole book of Judges. In the first verse, in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says, After Joshua and that generation died... Another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. And then in Judges 21, 25, in those days it says there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's the problem in Judges. That's the problem in our life. This kind of came home to me this week um, when I was talking with my little grandson um, he's, he's four, and he, uh, he kind of got in trouble at our house a week or so back because he, he got his uncle Trent's iPad and started watching construction videos without asking. He just ended up in his back room watching these videos. And so we told him, listen, when, when you want to watch or look at the iPad, you need to ask someone. So he's like, okay, okay, got it. So he came back over again this, this past week. He came out. I was outside on the patio. He came out to me, and I said, hey, what you been doing, Bubby? He 
instead of watching trans construction videos on his iPad? Oh. I, I said, um, so who did you ask to see if it was okay to use Trent's iPad? And he went, I asked myself. <laughs> and I said yes. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> cute. However, as I thought back on that, if I were totally honest with myself, if we were totally honest with ourselves, I think we could easily say that that is generally our typical response to why we give in to the desires of our flesh. It's just judges, 21, 25 all over. We're, we don't need a king. We're just going to do whatever's right in our own eyes. I asked myself, and I said yes. And that's the problem. That's the problem. The reason we do what's right in our own eyes is because we are like the Israelites. We like them, just like they are, we forget God. That's what it says. That's what the translation is. They forgot the Lord. And the word forget isn't like, oh, they, they oh, I am. Um, Ah, I just forgot. I didn't remember. I just, oh, I, oh, I forgot to be there at two o'clock when you told me. That's not the kind of forget. The word forget literally means <clears throat> ignoring. It means that the God, the God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit lose their re realness to you. That's what it means to forget God. God loses, he's not real to you any longer. And when we are living in our sinful desires of our flesh, our idols, that's what becomes real to us. And God gets forgotten. He's not real anymore. That's why we sin. We forget how he's proven himself faithful, powerful, holy, merciful, gracious, kind, and loving. And God throughout the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, has revealed himself as a husband, a true, perfect husband who has come after a very unworthy wife, Israel. And, and has brought her in. He has become the lover of her soul, but his people have chosen to, uh, who he chose to marry, have chosen to abandon him, abandon his presence abandon his inheritance, walk out on his love and run into the arms of a false god, another lover. James 4, James chapter 4, if you want the New Testament version of them, James calls those people adulterous. You adulterous people. Lovers of self, lovers of this world, are enemies of God, James says. And this is just showcased all over the book of Judges. And it comes out in Judges 2.17 where it says that the, the Israelites prostituted themselves after other gods and bowed down to them, turning aside from the way of obedience to God. And what this has done is this has led to what I've been calling, the, what I called last week the Judges cycle. Many uh, scholars call this the Judges cycle, um, which becomes the normative pattern um, that we see spiraling down throughout the book of Judges. Let me get my stuff in order. This morning, let me read to you from the book of Judges the text that we're going to, to, to kind of break into, and then I want to bring back the cycle again. Judges chapter 2, beginning at verse 16. It says, Then the Lord raised up judges, who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them, Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they prostituted after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of that judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. That, that phrase right there is just the whole purpose behind the Bible. God in his unbelievable pity, the word is relent, compassion. It's just, it's just his heart. It will never change. 
he will always be bent towards loving compassion for his people, no matter what they do. It's just who he is. But whenever it says, verse, verse 19, the judge died, they turned back and they were more corrupt than their fathers going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the angel of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them whether they'll take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Now chapter 3. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan, it was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war. This is why they're left to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites and who lived in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hermon, as far as Lebo and Moth. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses, which he says over and over again, this is what they're there for. Father, this is your word and your word will not return void and we pray that your word would capture our hearts today because it is your very word from your mouth that you have spoken. And oh Lord, how we need to come under and submit to the word of the Lord today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The judge's cycle. And this is where it begins. The people will do what is evil in the eyes of the Lord. They are going to do whatever is right in their own eyes. And when they do that, what it does is it just kindles the anger of the Lord. And, and I want you to think of it in terms of this way. Think of God as the husband whose wife that he went and sought after and brought in and gave her, rescued her from slavery, brought her in and gave her an inheritance, and this wife has walked out on God into the arms of another lover. And if it weren't even that bad, what, God, what these people do is they ask God for the money that they can use to spend to cheat on him. And they walk out on him. You picture, you picture a husband like that, that husband's anger will be kindled because he's jealous. And it's a holy, divine jealousy that God has for his wife who's left him. And so what God does in his mercy, he gives them over to an oppressor. He gives them over to an oppressor, and that leads the people to cry out. In a, in a form of repentance, sometimes true, godly repentance, sometimes worldly repentance. And listen, there's a difference between worldly grief and godly grief. Worldly grief, worldly repentance just wants the consequences to go away. Just wants to get the burden off our back. Just wants the suffering to lift. Just wants, God, I'll do anything. Just let that, let, let, let that go away. Get that out of my life. I don't want that anymore. And it says in 2 Corinthians, worldly grief leads and produces death. It doesn't go anywhere. But godly grief, godly repentance, it says it turns to God. And it begins to grieve over the husband. It's left. He's left. And it runs. It's grieving. And it says it leads to salvation without regret. That's the beauty of godly repentance. It's like I, I have run back into the arms of my husband Jesus. And so the people would cry out and God would raise up a judge. And that judge would deliver them from the hand of their oppressor. And there would be peace in the land that would follow. And then the judge would die. And Israel would recycle again and again, becoming more corrupt than the generation before. And they will spiral downwards through this entire book. That's why it's so tragic. What I want to show, three things this morning in sets of two. Three things in sets of two this morning from our text. One is I want to show from, from both Israel how we in our lives allow our gods, little g gods, our idols, to control us. Two, there are two ways our gods control us. 
But then we're going to see that there are also two ways that our capital G God tests us, followed by two examples of how our God delivers us. The first I want to look at are the two ways, sorry, the two ways our gods control us. Two ways our gods control us. And this takes us back to chapter 2, verse 3, where it says, God says, you have not obeyed my voice. What have you done? So now I say, I will not drive the nations out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Thorns and a snare. Thorns and a snare. These are illuminated. Thorns illuminate what an idol or a god is in our life, and a snare illustrates what thorns, or a snare illustrates what idols and gods do in our life. Very descriptive picture. What is an idol or a god in our life? Let's just start. We've talked about this before, but Rebecca Pippert, whom Tim Keller quotes from her book, Out of the Salt Shaker, this goes back to the 1980s, I believe. She says this about gods and idols. Whatever controls us is our god. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our life. That's a great definition of what a God is and does. Anything in this world, and it usually can be a very good thing, our health, our family, Gosh, our health right now, go, with what's going on, keeping, keep, keeping this room from being full right now, our health can become such a good thing. Family can be such a good thing. Work can be such a good thing. Financial security. But if any of these good things ends up controlling us, if we add any of these things to Christ's finished work to secure and, and provide for us our happiness, and our identity, they're the Lord of our life. They're gods. They control us. And, and these idols, these lords, become thorns. And when you think of a thorn, listen, a thorn, you had a thorn. Thorns are miserable, aren't they? They're just, they're just miserable. Um, wait, here's an example. When someone that you know whose acceptance you really, really want, it could be a spouse, could be a child, could be a parent, um, or it could be just someone you respect, and you, you want their acceptance, and you find out they're mad at you, or they shut the relationship down. You'll know that their acceptance is an idol, because you're not just upset about it, but the rejection is like a thorn. It's like a thorn in you. You're miserable. You're miserable. You are, you, you, you are, um, you can't get it off your mind. It consumes your attention like a thorn does. It holds you back. It, it can be crippling. It robs you of any joy that you might have. That's what a thorn does. That's what a God does in our life. That's what it is. It is. It's miserable. But here's what it does. It becomes a snare. Not just a thorn, but a snare. And here's what a snare does. A snare traps us. It binds us. It enslaves. It imprisons us. Thorns are miserable, but snares are suffocating. They suck the life out of motivation and freedom and love for God and others. And you'll see them expressed in these, these in, uh, ultra ways of anxiety and worry or panic or incapacitation, can't do anything, or self-absorption. You might see it in emotional drama that goes on in people's lives, they just, they just, just, just emotion, emoting all the time, or fits of rage that are coming out. These are all signs that there are thorns and snares in our life. That's all they are. They're indicators for us. Bob preached on that when he talked about our emotions becoming indicators of, what the, of what's ruling us, what's, what's controlling our life. And the bottom line problem with thorns and snares, with idols, is this. It's all about you. It's just all about you. Everything has to be right in your own eyes. It's all about you. And when it's not, you're a mess. You're miserable and you're enslaved. We have forgotten God at this point. We forget who he is. We forget who we are in him. And we forget what he's done on our behalf. And what that does is it leads to what I call in my life, and I think you might resonate with this, is what I call the sin cycle. 
We get into a cycle ourselves, much like the Israelites do, where we give into our flesh. We have this God, we have this idol, we want it, we don't want God, we forget God, we want this. We don't, it's because we don't know God. We give into the flesh and then there are consequences. Oh. We reap what we sow, it comes back to us at some point, and it leads us to the question of will we repent? Is there going to be repentance? And if so, will it be just worldly repentance, like get this thing off my back? Or will it be godly repentance? And yet, typically, if it's worldly repentance, what we would end up doing is we do our own little self-effort rescue. <laughs> we try to do something to get rid of it. We try to atone for it. We try to do other spiritual things to, to try and, and get over it, to cover it. And, and what that can do, we, we'll turn to other sources. We'll turn to Google. We'll turn to other things, authorities, to help give us peace of mind. Because that's what we want. That's all we want, right? You just give me, I just want peace of mind. I just want my life to be normal again. And we might get it. In fact, sometimes, oftentimes, we do get it until the next trial. And then we cycle right back into it. Another trial comes. Another trial comes. And what God has done in the second set of twos here that we talked about, yes, we see how our gods control us as two ways, as snares and thorns, but then the second way is, is the two ways that God is testing us. Our God is testing us at this point. And I go back to Judges 2.20, and we'll read these verses again. Now watch how God is testing Israel. God said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive at... Listen, this is remarkable, okay? Let me just say this right here. I'm going to pause right here. Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded and walked out on me into the arms of another lover... They have not obeyed my voice. I will no longer, and know what you expected to say, I will no longer tolerate this people. I am done with them. I will destroy them. But he doesn't do that. Do you know why? Because of the pity and compassion of our God's heart for his people. He loves us. With a love that will not let us go. No, he says, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. In order to test Israel by them, whether will they take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. And so the Lord left those nations, and they left them, it says, to test Israel by them. And here's what they're going to test them. They hadn't experienced war. This generation grew up, didn't know the Lord, didn't know the works he had done. They never fought. They didn't know what war was. And so he leaves them in order to test Israel by them whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. Oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. No, <laughs> wrong line. He, it was in order that this generation of the people of Israel might know war, verse 2, to teach war to those who had not known it before. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord. And see, God, rather than pour out his wrath and destroy Israel in his mercy. He leaves the nations and their gods with them. Why? Why? Because he loves them. And he wants to drive them back to him. He's giving them grace. Another opportunity to run back to the father, their husband. It's a testing of faith. And this is what God does in our life. When this next trial comes into our life, James says this, would you consider this joy, my friends? Count it joy when you face trials of various kinds. For the testing of your faith is producing endurance and endurance is there to produce character and draw us and make us more like Jesus Christ. That's what he's there for. It's, he, he is wanting, listen, whether you're facing suffering that has been self-imposed, meaning your sin has brought your suffering onto you, you're reaping consequences, for instance, or your suffering is beyond your control, it's coming from outside circumstances, whether either one, they are meant to draw you to humility away from what you think is right in your own eyes and back into a relationship of dependence and love for your Jesus. For your God. That's, that's what this is all here for. 
And so the two questions, here's the test. Number one, will they take care to walk in the way of the Lord? In other words, God is giving them time to take care, to, 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 to think. Who is God? And to look at their, this idol in their life, this Lord in your life, and say, do I, do I hate this thing? Listen, your flesh hates God. It's not just opposed to God. Your flesh, your sinful nature that is in every human being hates God. That, that, it, it doesn't want anything to do with God. Do I hate this idol that has enslaved me, that is driving me crazy, that's making me miserable? Do I long to run back to the lover of my soul? Our flesh, it just, it doesn't, it's not just that it hates God, it wants to be God. It wants to be God. It doesn't want to know God, it wants to be God. And so it leads to the second question, will they go to war? For the Lord. Will they go to war? Will they go to war against this flesh? Will they go into battle? He's testing them that they may know war. How to fight against the flesh inside of us. Will we go to war against the desires of our flesh? Galatians 5 is very clear. The desires of the flesh are opposed to the desires of the spirit and vice versa. Are we going to engage in this fight for the power of grace to be revealed in us for the display of his glory? Well, I want to tell you guys, we're not going to do it in our own strength. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope to help us begin to get out of the cycle. Will we ever get out of the cycle? I don't think so in this, life, in this, in this, in this world, no. But I think we can cut short circuit this thing much quicker through the gospel of grace. And that leads us with the final point, and that is the last set of twos, and these are two examples that God gives to us to show us how God delivers us. Two of the first three judges we read about give us living pictures of what we need to do, what it, what it looks like to go to war against our sin cycle. This is what we're declaring war on. Are you ready to declare war? I, I, I'm ready to declare war on my flesh. This is what God wants. I don't want this flesh anymore. I want him. I want him. Two examples. The first one is Othniel. The first judge we get. Well, probably the, the least flawed of all of them. In fact, no flaws are mentioned in Othniel, although we know he's a sinner. He was a mighty man. It tells us right off the bat the people did what's evil in the sight of the Lord and so God in his anger brought, a, brought the king of Mesopotamia in and the king of Mesopotamia enslaved and oppressed Israel for eight years. But in verse 9 it says, when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother and also Caleb's son-in-law. The spirit of the Lord was upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war. And the Lord gave Kushan, Rishathayim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over that guy. I don't want to repeat his name again. <laughs> now notice. Notice how God delivered Israel. The spirit of the Lord was upon Othniel and led him into war. And so Othniel went out, but it was at the Lord, it says, who gave the enemy into his hand. It was Othniel's faith that led him to trust God for the battle. And it was the Spirit of God that came upon him to do so. Just as the Lord sold Israel into the power of their enemy, now he gives their enemy into the hands of their deliverer, but he doesn't just do it through Othniel, he does it through his spirit. This is how God always defeats sin in our life. It's not through us. This story is perfectly telling. that Othniel's victory is not linked to his human effort, it is linked to God. 
It is the Spirit of God that we need, you need, desperately to overcome the Lord's in our life. John 6.63 is super clear about this, and it's one of my favorite verses, and I need this today. Jesus said, it is the Spirit who gives life. It is the Spirit that breathes life and power into our weakness. We're weak, but it is the Spirit that breathes life into our weakness. Listen, the flesh, the sin nature, it is no help at all. None. Jesus says, the words I have spoken, these are spirit, and these are life. You want to defeat the, you want to crush the enemy and sin in your life? Then you take the words of Jesus because there's spirit in their life, and you take them into your life, and you take them into your heart, and you start killing like crazy. <laughs> and the next, the next judge is going to show us how to do this. Ehud, Ehud, Judge number two. Again, it says the people, after, after Othniel died, the people started doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord and they began cycling again. And so God sends Moab and the king of Moab to oppress Israel for 18 years this time. 18 years. Now, Eglon, who was the king of Moab, it tells us, very frankly, he was a fat man. He was huge, way overweight. That's important in the story, and it's a picture for us. It says, when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man, The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Left-handed man. Tim Keller notes that God using a left-handed man is noteworthy. (laughs) And it is noteworthy because it says he was a Benjaminite. And the word Benjamin in, in, in Jew, in Hebrew, means son of the right hand. This man was left-handed. And the reason why that's important, because if you look at any reference to the right hand in the Bible, it's almost always linked to strength and ability. The right hand. Left-handed people were not considered strong, but weak. And Tim Keller points out, we don't know why, why it says that, because the way the NIV says, it says that Ehud was unable to use his right hand. It may have been that his right hand was crippled or paralyzed, or disabled, or something. We don't know. It just says he was left-handed. And what, what that meant then was when Moab invited Ehud into the court to pay tribute, it, obviously he posed no threat to them because he was left-handed. There was something about his right hand that led them to think, this guy's, this guy's like, he, he's not a threat at all. He's weak. He's weak. And again, the story goes, God wants to be the champion of our story. And he wants to reveal the power of his grace for the display of his glory through weakness. Weakness. It's God, not us, who will be exalted. It's God, not, not us, who will save. Our fleshly best, our right hand, our, what we go to for strength in our life is no help at all. Don't even go there. And so verse 16 says, And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And Ehud came to him, that is the king, as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said to King Eglon, I have a message from God for you. And the king arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into the belly of the fat king. Now, if you continue reading the story, it gets way more graphic and way more gross. And I want to tell you why. It's because the picture of what just happened is a picture of what God wants us to do to our sin. Because that is the picture of sin. When we read what happens to King Eglon at that point, it is disgusting. Because our sin is disgusting. So disgusting that Jesus took it all on himself at the cross. 
And it says as he hung, Isaiah 52, as he hung on the cross, he was marred, butchered beyond human resemblance. Couldn't even tell he was human. Why? Because it was a picture of our sin. God hates our sin. He hates your flesh. Do you? Do I? God wants to take the sword of the Spirit and ram that thing through this flesh, these lords of our life that have no power and are no help at all. (laughs) And he wants to be glorified in it. And he will. He will. It's worth noting that before Othniel became judge, Israel had been oppressed eight years, but when Othniel delivered them, they had peace in the land for 40 years. When Ehud, before Ehud became judge, Israel was oppressed for 18 years. But after Ehud delivered them, they had peace in the land for 80 years. Do you know why that's, that's so great? Eight years versus 40, 18 years versus 80. It's there to tell us that what we're struggling with right now is very short-lived compared to the eternal peace we are going to have with God. In fact, we can have right now. Listen, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And we have got to remind ourselves of that so often. I forget that. I ignore that. And we can't. We can't. Othniel and Ehud give us a picture of our deliverance, but even more so, they give a picture of our true deliverance, our true deliverer, Jesus Christ. And so it says in Judges that God gave his people over to oppressors, but that they would repent and then he would raise up a judge to deliver them, and that would become now the foreshadow for the gospel. And Romans chapter 8 tells us this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, and he is, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all, all things? So God gives the, the people over to an enemy, then raises up a judge to deliver them. But what does God do now for us? God gives up his only son in our place for us. He doesn't spare him. Hmm. Yes, Jesus would come in the spirit. Yes, Jesus would kill the accuser and the enemy. But he would do so not through military victory, but through the shedding of his blood, through his murder. What a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And he does so, shedding his own blood. Guess who he does that for? He does it for his enemies. Like me and you. Romans 5. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Reconciled, do you know what reconciled means now? Picture the Grand Canyon like this. <laughs> it's been, the canyon is gone. We have been reconciled. We now have peace with God. When you have peace with God, you don't need peace of mind. Because peace with God surpasses all understanding. Peace with God. On the cross, our sin was given to Jesus. The word is imputed. It was imputed on Jesus so that his righteousness would be imputed on us. It's not a fair exchange at all. It's grace. And finally, notice in Judges 2.18, for the the Israelites, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, it says that the Lord was with them the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. Notice, it says, the Lord was with the judge. It doesn't say the Lord was with the people. The people had rebelled against him. 
But the Lord was with the judge. So what that meant was, as long as the people were in and under the judge, they were safe from the hand of their enemies. But as soon as the judge died, they were no longer safe. But our judge is different. Our judge lives. Jesus lives. He lives. He lives. Jesus was raised from the dead for our justification, Romans 4 says. It says he was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification, for our being made right, to secure our freedom from the enemy of death and hell once and for all. Satan no longer has power on that. Authority over that. And this power of grace, our salvation, here's what Titus 2 says, the grace of God that has appeared bringing salvation, it's training us. You got it? It doesn't just save you. It trains you for, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age while we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, it's grace, not your best effort. <laughs> it's not man's best effort. It's grace that trains us for war, to kill ungodliness, to kill these worldly passions, to kill these lords in our life and to live lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. So what do we do? Okay, can't use my own effort. What do I do? <laughs> Here's what we do. We start depending on God and his grace daily. In fact, I'll show you what it looks like right here. The first thing we do, we get up in the morning. I, I, I suggest you start before bed and get yourself ready because when I wake up in the morning, I am not ready to go to war. I am already defeated the moment I wake up in the morning. So I need to get myself ready. You go to war and you do it by dying daily. And when Paul says I die daily, here's what he didn't mean. He didn't mean I do it once. He means I die all day long. I die daily. And from there, we fight the good fight of faith. And it is faith in the Spirit of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of the Father. It's that, that's where our faith goes. It's in His grace. We fight the good fight of faith in the strength of his might, putting on the whole armor of God, standing against the schemes of the devil. The devil wants to make sure you feel condemned, like you're not doing enough. And when he does that, just remind him, you're right, he's right, I'm not doing enough because I can't do anything. My flesh is no help at all. I can only do what I do in the strength of the, the grace of God. We stand against the schemes of the devil. We put to death by the Spirit the misdeeds, the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the misdeeds of the body. Notice it doesn't say put to death the misdeeds of the body. We do it by the Spirit. And how do we do that? By praying in the Spirit without ceasing. It's praying all day. It's praying for everything. God, I... I I can't go to bed without you. I can't get up without you. I can't eat without you. I can't go to work without you. I can't get out of my car without you. I can't, that person right there, I can't talk to them without you. I'm just breathe, breathing. Prayer is your oxygen. It is your breath. You're taking all day long. Spirit, help me. Spirit, I need you. I'm weak. And the Spirit is so ready to help us in our weakness. Romans 8, 826. And then we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is how we go to war, guys. Every thought. If God hates your flesh and you hate your flesh, you better believe it. What about the thoughts I miss? <laughs> Praise be to God for grace. We run to the cross and we, we, we confess and we repent. And when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins so that we can now take captive that thought. Amen. Taking up the living and active word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, sharper than Ehud's 
sword from his right thigh. Sharper than that, it pierces to dividing soul and spirit, discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That sword, it, that, your sword is the word of God. We've got to have the word of God dwelling in us so that when these thoughts and accusations and flesh and desires and we don't want God and we want to forget God, we get that sword out and say, no, 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 no. And you say, this is exhausting. Yes, but it's short. And it doesn't compare to an eternal weight of glory that, that awaits us. We fight. And we have this. Always with confidence drawing near to the throne of grace where we receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And I want to tell you some band, I want you guys to come up here because I want to sing out this morning, band. But I want to remind you of this. I need this this morning. I got this this week. Oftentimes in the Bible, we hear the prophets and we hear the psalmist and we hear them say things to God like, you said, you said, God. And what they're doing is they are, they are, they are going back to God on his promise and they're holding him to that promise, saying, God, you said, you said. And I, I'm taking Hebrews 4.16 here as one of those many promises that I need into my day. God, you said, that if I draw near to the throne of grace, I have confidence to do this, God, and you said I will receive mercy and find grace to help me in my time of need. He promises. He comes through. God is trustworthy. You can bank on it. The Holy Spirit is life. And he is here to reveal the amazing grace and mercy of a divine husband who will not break his covenant with us, whose love will not let us go. Judges instructs us, run back every day, all day long, run back into his heart. It's a battle. It can be exhausting. But I give you this promise. Death is swallowed up in victory for you. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. Oh, help me, God. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In the Lord your labor is not in vain. In you and your self-effort, no help at all, but in him we have victory. Let's worship our God this morning.
Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal? Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David. Every people in tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and praise to God. The sun. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor? prayer this morning, would you, I'm, I will be glad to pray or talk to you or share the gospel with you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning as your savior, you're missing out on a freedom and a peace that you probably have never had before. And it's not easy, this Christian life, but this life in Christ is short and with him is forever peace. So come Come to Jesus today if you've not. Come to Jesus, please. I beg you, come to Jesus today. Father, thank you. Your blessing upon this, your people. Salvation upon those who do, do not know you today. May it come through your spirit. Awaken our hearts, Father, that we would seek to go to war against the flesh so that we would, for your glory, for the display of your glory and for your name and by your grace, in Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. 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 Go in grace, church.